Our Grace Point journey is to fall in love with Jesus through the study of His Word. We see a family of believers who navigate through life in obedience to the truth of the Gospel. A path where our marriages are welded together. Whereas parents, we enjoy and direct our children in the way of the Lord. Where we pursue to connect with our neighbors and influence our workplaces and schools by showing them God's love. We envision being a generation of disciples who impact our world for Christ, for the glory of God, for the sake of the gospel. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. We're so glad that you're here today. Uh, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with me uh, to the book of Matthew chapter 10. And today we are continuing in a final uh, part of our vision. Uh, and we want to talk today about how we pursue to connect with our neighbors. As you heard on the video here, the last part of our vision, we pursue to connect with our neighbors and influence our workplace and schools by showing them God's love. Everybody say God's love. And we envision being a generation of disciples who impact our world for Christ, for the glory of God, and for the sake of the gospel. So, Father, thank you this morning for being here with us. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us as a church and as individuals. And, Lord, as we come before your presence to hear your word, Father, anoint my lips, my heart, my soul as I speak. Lord, let it not be my thoughts or my words, but your thoughts and your words. And let your people hear that which you have for them today. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Praise God. Uh, we connect with our neighbors to influence our workplaces and our schools by showing them God's love. Did you know that as Christians, we have been put in the world to be an influence? And an influence for godliness, an influence for Christ. You know, when uh, you plant a garden, you don't have to plant weeds. Did you know that? They, they just grow, right? Uh, and so in order for your garden to be a good garden, you have to take care of it, right? You have to be careful of the weeds. You have to weed them out. Well, see, we are here today, and we are in the middle of a world that's grown, with, overgrown with weeds. Come on. And we are those laborers that God has called into this garden that is, that is uh, overgrown with sin and unrighteousness and to begin to live our life in such a way that we create a, an environment or an example, I should say, uh, for the world around us. And not just as an example, but a life lived for the glory of God so that people can come to know the same God that we know. Come on. Amen. There's a lot of people who think, you know, that, that uh, it doesn't make a difference what you believe. Uh, it doesn't make a difference, you know, what church you go to. It doesn't make a difference what uh, uh, religion you belong to. But I'm here to tell you today, that's not what Jesus said. And we're followers of Jesus. Come on. And so we are here to influence uh, with the love of God. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the greatest demonstration of God's love that we could give someone? Think about that. Because most of the time we think, oh, well, you know, we want to hug him. We want to make him feel good. We want to give him, you know, some, some cookies and, and you know, uh, invite him to lunch, show them some good deeds and, and make them feel love. And that's all good and great. But that's just temporal. Those things are going to pass away. The cookies are going to be eaten, right? The meal is going to be eaten, all of that. The hug's going to be, you know, done over, over with. Uh, but how do we demonstrate? How did God demonstrate his love for us and how can we demonstrate God's love for someone? John 3.16 says that God demonstrated his love for us by what? Giving his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so if I'd ask you, how do we demonstrate God's love to someone? The greatest demonstration of love is for us to give them Jesus. Did you hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Make them feel good. Give them cookies and fine. Oh, that's good. But if you don't give them Jesus, you haven't really loved them the way God wants you to love them. And so that's so important. And the second question I have is, what does the Bible say is God's greatest demonstration of his love? We found that, uh, uh, we mentioned it uh, earlier, but Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. All right, so the demonstration of the love, 
Jesus was sent to the world by the Father, but his demonstration for us was that he gave his life. He was willing to die for us. We have on here in our vision that it's... uh, that we envision raising up a generation of disciples who impact our world for Christ. I want you to notice the verbs that we use here uh, to connect, to influence, to impact our world for Christ. It's not a uh, kind of a laid back approach, a sedentary kind of uh, lifestyle. It is a, an active lifestyle. It's necessary for us here at Grace Point, I believe it's vital, to raise up a generation of disciples who will impact their world for Christ and for the sake of the gospel. Come on. That's vital. That's important. If not, we just become just another group, just like everybody else. And I'm wondering, where does the glory of God come into all of this? Think about that because our our vision ends with that we do this for the glory of God and for the sake of the gospel. And where does the glory of God come in to all of this? And this is kind of what I want to uh, emphasize today and go into today. Uh, there's a very pertinent questions that we all have to be interested in as followers of Christ uh, and his commands to us as believers, as followers of the Lord. You know, when our church says, or our church vision, I should say, says that we seek to pursue, to connect with our neighbors and influence them, what do we really mean? Now, we can only see these things happen. We can only see these things come to pass if we really truly understand as a church and as individuals and followers of Jesus Christ what the gospel is truly about. I want to emphasize that again. In order for us to influence people in the way God wants us to influence them, in order for us to pursue to connect and reach them, we need to know what the gospel really is truly about as a church and as individuals. The church today, the state of the church today is very disheartening, I should say, in many ways. Because historically, the church has always believed that the gospel, if I say the gospel, has always been the message of faith in Christ. Historically, the church, that's the message the church has always taught. But it isn't the message that a lot of churches today are emphasizing. I find as I look around that a lot of churches are emphasizing so much of the temporal life and the blessings and the temporal blessings, and they make that the big thing that they promote. That's not what the early church did. It's not historically what the church has done. Now, Since the New Testament era, Christians have always believed that the only way for sinners to avoid hell and the judgment to come and be reconciled to God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can save you from the judgment of God that is to come. And for centuries, Christians have given their lives for this message, for the gospel. They've shed their blood. We've sent missionaries, countless missionaries throughout the world to proclaim this message of exclusivity. That means that there is no other one like it. It is exclusive. And today, with the greatest means that we have at our disposal, technology, the ability to get a message out all over the world in a moment of time to proclaim the glories of the gospel and the glories of Christ, the church now more than ever has become confused as to whether the gospel is even necessary. The church is embarrassed by the realities of sin and hell. Preachers no longer want to preach that. They're fearful of offending The people who are perishing by even mentioning that they need to repent. The church is desperate to save God's reputation from being responsible for anyone's condemnation. Oh, no, we don't want to make God, you know, we don't want to ruin God's reputation. But I tell you here, God doesn't need you to protect his reputation. He can do that all on his own. He just needs us to be faithful to God. So the modern church 
raises the question even of whether people even need to hear the gospel to be saved or believe in Jesus anymore. We have an abridged, we have a, an ambiguous view of the gospel that has captivated the church today in many quarters. Well-known believers, even uh, stars, people who uh, uh, say they have come to believe in Christ, uh, make their faith a private thing. When they're asked about Christ, well, you know, my faith is private. Folks, if your faith is private, it's not the Christian faith. Did you hear? And people say, well, I like to keep my faith private. Well, that's not the Christian faith. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Matthew 10, verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And he went on to say, and everyone who denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. No, the Christian faith is in private. And that's why I said, if you say, well, my, my faith in God is private. It's not the Christian faith. And this is what a lot of people have uh, uh, promoted, and it's not true. If one is ashamed of the gospel, it probably is a strong indication that you've not yet believed the gospel. Because the gospel of Christ should be the most private, or excuse me, public thing about you. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 1 verse 9, this is the New Living Translation, John the Apostle was banished to the island of Patmos. Listen to what he says. I, John, your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us, I was exiled to the island of Patmos. Why was he exiled? For preaching the word of God. Why was he exiled to the island of Patmos? For the testimony about Jesus. Here's a guy who wasn't quiet. It wasn't private. If it was private, he'd have been wherever he was. But no, he was exiled because they couldn't shut him up. I was talking to Gordon before the service. He was telling me he ran into an old guy at the store. And he, was, he greeted him and he greeted him. And then he started talking a little bit about. And then he, he, he said, well, do you know Jesus? The guy asked uh, uh, Gordon, and Gordon says, yes. He says, oh, you already know Jesus. Okay, well, I need to go talk to somebody else. <laughs> and Gordon said, yeah, go on. That's good. Amen. Hallelujah. Because your faith is not private. Christianity is not private. It's very public. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Go to Matthew chapter 7 now. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, they were to enter by the narrow gate. Everybody say narrow. narrow. See the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many. How many? Many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few. How many? Few who find it. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, in the, in the last days, there's going to be a big revival, and a lot of people are going to, you know, millions of people are going to turn to the Lord. Well, that's not really true. Matter of fact, the closer we get to the end of the age, the more people are going to reject the gospel. And Jesus said they're few compared to many. Many will enter by the broad gate. So there are people trying to bulldoze the narrow gate and make it wider. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, Christian so-called pastors and teachers. They want to make the, the narrow gate that Jesus talked about, they want to expand it to include more, you know, people. Well, we, let's not get too technical about Jesus. Let's not talk about Jesus being the only way. We know that for us, but, you know, for other people, they don't understand it. So let's just make that gate wider so other people can enter in. Excuse me, we don't have that authority. Jesus said, that we're to enter by the narrow gate because the wide gate leads to destruction. And today I find that in the modern church today, there is a, a belief, there's a prominent uh, surging belief that's going on right now. It's called natural theology. You may have heard about it. Natural theology basically says that man inherently has the ability within him to reason himself to God. 
apart from the Bible or apart from any divine revelation, he can, he's got a little spark of divinity. You know, uh, many different uh, uh, religions talk about different things. You know, it's, it's the, the, you know, the, 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 the spark of divinity within each and every one of us. And all of us can somehow find God. Through just understanding and reason alone. We don't need revelation. God doesn't need to reveal himself or reveal what salvation is about. Because we can find it uh, on our own. So these divergent views that we find in the, in the, in the body of Christ today. In the church I should say at large. Uh, from the Bible point of view. These uh, views that have flooded the church have become, listen to me, a direct threat to the true gospel. The desire to expand and to open up the gate is a direct threat to the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm saying if we want to influence people for God, we need to know what the gospel is. We need to know exactly what the Bible teaches us about man and his place before God so that we can understand what the gospel is supposed to do in their life. And before we can influence our neighbors, before we can influence our workplace, before we can influence our schools with the gospel, we have to be very clear about what it is. Because a false gospel, listen, always brings the divine curse upon those who alter it. In Galatians chapter 6, Excuse me, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says this, I am astonished, he tells the churches of Galatia, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a what? A different gospel. Not that there is not another, not that there is another, I should say, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And, but even if we, if I say we, See, we need to be careful that we don't distort the gospel. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, Paul says, contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be a curse. That word means anathema, the divine curse. And again, Paul says in verse 9, and as we've said before, so I now say it again. In other words, I'm going to repeat this because this is important. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be anathema, accursed. For now am I seeking the approval of men? See, the only reason that you would change the gospel is because you're, you're embarrassed about the gospel. The only reason you want to soften it for sinners is because, you know, you don't want to talk about repentance. You don't want to talk about hell, that if you don't turn to Christ, you will end up in hell. That if you don't repent and turn to Christ is the only way you will end up under the judgment of God. There isn't any doubt about that because Jesus said that's what would happen. And so Paul said, do I try to please men now? Am I trying to please men or am I trying to please God? He said, if I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Take that to heart. If you try to please people, you're not serving Christ. Some people tell me, well, Pastor, you know, how can you be so bold to talk about that? You know what? I'm too old now to care about what people think. Amen. Really, I, I, I'm telling you. You know, when I was younger, I tried to get people to like me. and uh, yeah, uh, No. Mm -mm. I'd rather you know the truth. Even if it makes you uncomfortable or you decide you don't want to come back. But you'll never stand before God and say, I didn't know. Because the Lord will rewind the tape and say, there's Pastor Danny Rodriguez telling you that. <laughs> a curse. So is it true? Is natural theology, the surging belief in the, in the church today, in the modern church, true? That man can inherently, that he has the ability somehow to reason himself towards God. Let's look at this for a moment. Is it true? I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. Because in Romans chapter 1, Paul presents a case against this idea of natural theology. And I want you to follow it closely with me so that you understand it. Does God reveal himself in nature? Yes. The Bible says that God created everything and the power of God is made manifest in, in nature. I mean, you don't have to be a great genius to understand that even your own body, 
uh, you know, it, it, like if you look at a, at a, stop, at a watch and you, and you, and you find, get a nice watch and you open it up inside the old watches, you find what? These little gears, right? Little gears that turn. If one of those gears goes bad, if one of those teeth breaks, what happens to that watch? It doesn't work anymore because that thing that can't turn anymore, right? And so you realize that everything inside that watch has to work perfectly in order for that watch to work. Once that little teeth come off that little circle, it's not going to work anymore. You have to replace that wheel. Well, see, your body is created in such a way that I, I don't know any science majors in here. How many body systems do we have in our body? Anybody know? Eleven. Eleven. Thank you. Who? Eleven. Thank you, Jessica. Give her a hand. All right. <laughs> Eleven body systems. That means that your, your circulatory system, you know, your uh, lymphatic system, you get all these different systems in your body that have to work together. If one of those systems fails, guess what happens to the others? They fail. And that's why if one of your systems in your body stops functioning, you'll eventually die. Think about it. God created all these different systems within your body, and they all work together. Think about the design of that. They all have to work together in order for you to continue living. Well, this God who created everything, the Bible tells us here in Romans chapter 1 that Paul says that from the created order, we see the power of God. God has revealed himself in creation. If I say creation. That's nature. That's, that's what natural theology comes about and says, yeah, we look in creation and people can look and see that there's a creation and they can then turn to God because they see the great power of God that God has, uh, you know, accomplished. In Romans chapter 2, Paul says in verse 15, something else that God has put in man. Not only has he shown him his creation, but in, in, in verse 15, it tells us that the work of the law, that is the law of God, the knowledge of right and wrong is written on the hearts, the hearts of men, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts excuse, accuse or excuse them. So Paul is saying here that the law of God, which was given to Israel, right? The written law, the Ten Commandments was written to, uh, uh, to the law, uh, uh, excuse me, to Israel. He said he put that knowledge of right and wrong inside of man. We call it the conscience. So man has a witness of God, not only in the creation, but in the witness inside. Do people know right from wrong? Of course they do. Of course they do. That's why whenever people, even they don't know the Lord, whenever they steal something, what do they do? They hide. They do it so nobody's watching, right? Why? Because inside you know that what you're about to do is wrong. You shouldn't steal other people's stuff. And so God put that inside of us, right? To, to murder other people or, or to steal from them. All those things are inherent. We call it the conscience. So God has revealed himself in creation and in the moral law written in the heart, in the conscience of man. But Paul tells us that this knowledge that natural man has isn't enough to save him. Go to Ephes Hold your place in Romans. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Why is it that the knowledge of the universe... The knowledge of right and wrong isn't enough for people to find their way to God and to be saved. Well, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 1, it is because we are dead. You were dead. He's, he's talking to Christians now, so this is their past life. You were dead in what? In the trespasses and sins. When? When you walked before in the world under the prince of the power of the air. So we were spiritually dead. That is why man, even though he gains this knowledge, cannot come to God on his own through that knowledge. He's spiritually dead, lost. He's ignorant of God. Now, what does man do with the knowledge that he does have? He looks at the universe and he thinks, man, somebody had to have created all this, right? He sees the, the, the moral law written in his heart. He knows right from wrong. So what does he do with that knowledge? Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Here's what Paul says. In Romans 1, verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, what do they do? What do they do? They suppress the truth. You see, so even though they see 
the created order. And you hear, I mean, you, if you've ever heard like uh, great uh, intellects like uh, atheists or people like that who, who, who try to deny the existence of God, they have to deny the universe existence in some way. And so they come up with the idea, well, well, it's always existed, you know. Except that Einstein proved that that wasn't true. The second law of thermodynamics rebuts that, right? Everything is tending towards coldness, towards the loss, finally, of energy. So if it was eternal, it would be refiring itself. We would continually continue going. But Einstein proved that the end of the universe is maximum entropy, he says, when everything just loses all the energy. That's the law. And if you don't believe in that law, Slice an apple open and leave it open. And what happens to it? It starts to get brown, right? Immediately. The air, right, begins to shrivel it up and begins to die, right? That's the law of thermodynamics. So God made the universe, put in man the moral law. But man, even though he sees this, even though he reasons this, he suppresses, Paul says, the truth by their unrighteousness. This is the response of the unbelieving heart. Because at the core, we know that man without God is corrupt. He's wicked, he's evil, he's sinful, and he's unrighteous. Now look at verse 19 there in chapter 1 of Romans. Verse 19, Paul goes on to say, for what can be known about God is plain to them, right? Talking about people who are, who are lost because God has showed it to them, right? He, how has he shown it to them? Well, he's shown it to them in the creation. He's shown it to them in, his, in the conscience that he's written in the heart. For his invisible attributes, verse 20, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So now if people see this, well, yeah, I see a universe. Yeah, I see that there's, you know, order. I see the, the body, you know, you can't study the body, like I said, and all, why is it that all the systems operate together? I mean, this, this isn't just something that happens by accident. We know that whatever is created by accident in the, immediately is destroyed by accident too, right? Somebody said a, 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 a monkey at a typewriter banging away, right? <laughs> could eventually, by accident, come up with to be or not to be? That is the question. But what are the next strokes? Right? Because what chance creates, it almost instantaneously, instantaneously annihilates. So if we're here by chance, we should have been gone a long time ago. So we're not here by chance. We're here by design. The Bible says that God created all this. He designed all of creation, and man knows this, and man has given a witness. What does he do with that knowledge? Can that knowledge bring him to God? No, here's what Paul says that knowledge does. Look at verse 20. He says, all the invisible attributes, his divine power, all those things are made known to, to, by God to, to people who are lost, so that they are without excuse. So God has created all of this. He's shown it to man. And the only thing that knowledge does is it doesn't give man an excuse anymore why he didn't believe. And the reason that that knowledge is not enough to bring him to God is because, again, what does man's wicked heart do? It suppresses the truth by unrighteousness. So sinners can't conjure up their own salvation by reason of the universe alone or even the conscience that God has put in man. He doesn't have that ability because he is lost, he is dead in sin, and his own heart and wicked heart makes an excuse. And God says, this is evidence so that you can never say, I didn't know. You are without excuse, he tells man. So God's self-revelation through the created order is not enough to save sinners. And yet we're told today that yes, even people way back, you know, in the, in the bush or whatever, all they have to do is they have to see the creation and turn to God. And so they don't really need to hear the gospel because, you know, nobody's over there. Nobody can preach the gospel to them. They can come just by observing the created order. And what that does, again, is a direct attack on the gospel because what they're saying is that the gospel is really not needed. 
You know, all those missionaries that went, you know, back in the, in, whenever in history, and they all shed their blood and died. Yeah, that was, that was, that was good, but, you know, it was really necessary. Really. Why did Jesus tell us then, go into the world and preach the gospel? If it wasn't necessary. And so it's an attack directly upon the gospel and the exclusivity of the gospel. Now listen to this. God's revelation through creation is not enough to save sinners. It's only enough to condemn them. The created order tells people there has to be a designer. But instead of that information leading them to the designer... They suppress that by their sin, by their unrighteousness, and refuse to acknowledge God. And God says, that's the sign that you are without excuse. And whatever, you know, faint or glimmer of light a person has and may find by reason, because man has been given the ability to reason, uh, and conscience, he actually ends up snuffing it out. In verse 21, He says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They did not give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their what? Foolish hearts were darkened. See, any kind of light, any glimmer of light that a man could have naturally without God's aid, he snuffs it out. And this is the truth, folks, of the foundation of the whole biblical understanding of salvation. The sinner is utterly unable and is utterly unwilling to believe the truth by himself. Everybody say by himself. He can't do it. The Bible says in Romans 3 that no one seeks for God. And I know people say, yeah, pastor, but I know people that come to church, they're looking for God. No, they're looking for relief. Now, many of them do come and they hear the gospel and do find God. But man isn't looking for God. You say, people, they're coming to church now. So people say, well, they come to church. Well, people come to church for many different reasons. But the sinner doesn't come to church because he's looking for God. The sinner comes to church because he's looking for somebody to pray for him so that God can do something. My kids are lost. They're on drugs. Pray for them. See, that's what drives them. The need drives them. But it isn't until the gospel comes that a person understands his real need. And his real need is that he's a sinner. He's lost. And only God can open the eyes and the ears of sinners to hear the truth of the gospel to be saved. I was to tell you, and I guess I have told you before, some of the great names, and I can name some of them that we consider great names in the evangelical world who started going down this path of natural theology. Big names. You'd be surprised if you heard them, their own words. Saying, well, yeah, people don't need to really believe in Jesus as long as they, they're looking for God. But I don't know where you get that because the Bible says nobody does that. Matter of fact, nobody comes to God unless the fa- to Jesus unless the Father draws him. And he does that drawing by the gospel. This is the truth that the heart of the biblical understanding of salvation. Man cannot, on his own, unaided by God's divine power, come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I believe this is such an important doctrine, probably one of the most important doctrines of all of Scripture, because if you get this wrong, you're going to get everything else that follows wrong. And none of us can actually fathom God's work in salvation without first understanding how sinful man really is. Oftentimes we think that God came to save people that were, they weren't that bad, you know. Yeah, they were sinners, but not that bad. You know, there's a book written back in the, I don't know, it was the 70s or so. Maybe, I don't know. I'm old now, I don't remember. Um, It was called, I'm okay, you're okay. Somebody, anybody remember that? Yeah, I'm okay, you're okay. In other words, we're okay, we're not that bad. But if you don't understand how depraved man is without God, how far into sin man has fallen, so much that the Bible calls him dead in sin. 
And that apart from the, listen, apart from the divine grace of God intervening, sinners cannot, with the knowledge of the universe, with the knowledge of conscience, come to a saving knowledge of Christ. If they could, we wouldn't need the gospel. And because today people want to open the path and, and the gate and make it broader, they start compromising the gospel. And you hear it. Well, yes, you know, people from other religions too. You know, it's other ways because they can't just be one way. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus said there is only one way. You know, sinners, only instinct. The Bible is very clear on this. And we read here in Romans chapter 1. You go back and read it all yourself. Their only instinct in their natural fallen state is to dishonor God. Because their heart has been overtaken by spiritual darkness. That's the instinct of man. In Romans 1 verse 22. Paul goes on to say that men exchange the glory of the immortal God for images. Resembling mortal man and birds and animals. And creeping things. They became, in verse 22, he says they, they claimed to be wise, but they became what? Fools. Now this is interesting. I was reading this, uh, uh, and, and I believe the Holy Spirit uh, dropped this in my heart. It says that these men, without God, these men that are lost, the sinners, says they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images. They exchange the glory of God, listen, for images. And I was, I was thinking that Paul says that the wife, and I want to speak to the man real quickly here, that the wife, the woman, is the glory of the man. Is that right? In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, I think it's verse 7, that the woman is the glory of man. Listen, man, the woman, the wife, is the glory of the man, of her husband. Now, what does it say here? That men, sinners, they changed, exchanged the glory of God for images. And so men, listen, and here's an area where many men fall into. Pornography. You're married. And pornography is the exchanging of the glory, which is your wife, for images. Think about that. The glory that God gave you, the woman, the wife that God gave you, you exchange her to start viewing images. And that's what fallen man has done. How deep is sin? How corrupting is it? Paul says they become futile and foolish and the heart darkens. You see, because sinners reject the witness of the creation, they reject the witness of their own conscience. The Bible says he stands condemned before God. Every man does. So where does... Uh, this natural theology ultimately get lost man. Well, it leads him to utter degradation, to utter corruption. Paul ends in verse uh, 29 of chapter 1 there. He ends by saying this, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And here it is. Here's where it takes you. Filled with all manner of unrighteousness and evil and covetousness and malice. Full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and maliciousness. Gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. You know, far from finding God on his own, Man, unaided by the grace of God, 
The unrepentant man, you know what he becomes? He becomes a champion. He becomes a cheerleader for everything that the Lord opposes. And Paul writes it in, all in there. Think about that. Everything that God is against, man ends up embracing. You know, as you look at what's happening in our country, and you look at all the, the, the unceasing attacks against the former president, President Trump. You see the unceasing attacks and the continual, the continual. And I look at that and I say, that's nothing but an evil, depraved, corrupt heart of hate. That's what it is. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. Sin is no respecter of persons. But when you see something over and over and over and, and, and we, you know, we got rid of this and now we're going to find something else and that, that, that we're going to find this. You see that. You see the depravity of human nature. And when you see that, instead of cheerleading it and championing it, you know, somebody said to me a long time ago, what you laugh about and what you cry about reveals what your character is like. Oftentimes we laugh at the things that should break our heart. We laugh at the things that should, that should just say, God, this is terrible. I remember once I was watching a movie, my wife and I were watching a movie, and, and I remember, and, there, and in the movie there was this homosexual scene, and, and it was funny, we were all laughing, and then, it, and then the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, why are you laughing at something that I say is an abomination? And I found myself having to repent before God and say, God, you're right. Here we all thinking this is entertainment. This is entertainment. This is what God's going to judge one day. And you're <laughs> laughing and approving. And I had to repent before God and say, Lord, forgive me for treating lightly the things that you say are an abomination. You see, unaided and unilluminated by a divine touch of God, natural man's condition without the gospel is that he will never find his way to God. He'll never find his way to the true and living God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we read that man, listen, the natural man, the natural person does not what? He doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. Remember why? Because as soon as the Spirit, even, even when you begin to talk about them, their whole thing initially is to repress, is to repress the truth. Their foolishness, they're a folly to him. The natural man without God, he says, he thinks it's foolishness. He thinks you're a fool. You talk to him about the things of God. He's not able to understand them. Remember we said he's got all this reasoning power. He sees the universe. He sees all of that. And he sees that, you know, there's, there's justice. There, there's right and wrong. There's things that, you know, that he knows. So where did those come from? He starts to reason. But that's not enough. Because the natural things, the natural things that he reasons with, he cannot understand spiritual things. He can't tie them spiritually. He doesn't know what they all mean. That's why the grace, the gospel is called the grace gospel. Because it takes the grace of God to come and intersect the darkness, the, the logic and the reason of men that is darkened by his heart of sin. It says here that the things of God, the Spirit of God, they are, cannot, he's not able to understand them. He can't even understand them because they are spiritually discerned and he's spiritually dead. So without God's intervention, he can't hope to find God on his own. Look at verse 18 of chapter 1. You're in 1 Corinthians there. You see, when sinners hear the gospel, everybody say the gospel. When they hear the gospel of Christ, they initially reject it. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, listen to this first part. For the word of the cross is foolishness. It's folly to those who are perishing. What is it? See, so when you talk to people about the Lord, you would expect immediately, initially, there's going to be a reaction. There's going to be a response of rejection. And oftentimes God is drawing people. And, and sometimes you'll talk to people and you'll begin to minister to them and they're open. Why? Because God has already intervened. It's not because you're so, you know, great at presenting the gospel. 
Somebody, somebody told me one, asked me one time, well, how, you know, when we talk to people about the Lord and, and, and they start getting angry, so what should we continue doing? I said, well, there's a difference. Resistance and anger are two different things, right? Naturally, man is resistant to the gospel. You can expect that. They're going to be like uncomfortable and, you know, it's because man suppresses the truth. I said, but whenever they start telling you, stop talking or I'm going to slap you then you need to stop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because now they're not just, it's not just a natural resistance to the message. Now it's a resistance to the messenger as well. And just take it, you know, okay, well, God hasn't prepared that heart yet. Remember, God has to draw people to Jesus. It isn't your ability to explain everything perfectly. And people say, well, I don't know if I can talk to people perfectly. You don't have to. You just have to know the essence of the gospel. Man's lost. He can't come to Christ without God intervening. And so when you're talking to someone, if they're responding to the message, they can only respond because God is intervening. And the word of the cross is foolishness. It says to those who are perishing. This is how they take it initially. But to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. God is doing something in us in our life through the gospel. Why? Because we've already come to Christ. In verse 19, he goes on and he says that man, listen, man's wisdom. Look at verse 19. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 19 and 20. Listen, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and, I will, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart, God says. Where is the one who is wise? Paul is asking the question. Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? In other words, where are the people who are really intellects, the philosophers, the intellectuals of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You see, to God, the most elite, the most sophisticated, the most articulate communicator, the best debaters in the world are fools. Why? You know, Paul, he faced these men in his day. As a matter of fact, he went to a city called Athens. And in Athens, in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 16, he said it was a city that was given over to idolatry. In Acts chapter 17, verse 16, he saw the idols in the city full of idolatry. And yet this was a place and a center of great debates and philosophical arguments and so Paul in Athens, he goes to a place called the Areopagus. And the Areopagus was a place where all these intellectual people would get together and they would uh, discuss and debate philosophy and, the, and you know, the, the world and everything else. And, you know, there was many different schools and, and, and people and intellectuals there. And so they got together in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 22, if you put that up for me, Acts chapter 17. And verse 22, Paul was standing in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, he said, I perceive. Now, remember, he's talking to very intellectual people, people who are great debaters. And he gets up and he's going to preach a simple message. Because the, the, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, that person's really educated. Well, that's Okay. Because the gospel is the power of God to change people. And they're standing in the midst of this place where all these intellectuals are. And he says, men of Athens, I perceive that you're very religious. In every way you're very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. And I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. All right, so here are, the, here are these uh, uh, intellectual men, these debaters, and they talk about the universe and everything and how everything came about and created. Everybody's in their own ideas. And, and, and because, you know, again, just the fact that you're intellectual and have great, you know, debates doesn't mean that it gets you to God. And so these men are lost. And, and, and here's the thing. I guess they figure, you know, well, we, we're not sure about so many ideas. And, but, but so lest we miss it, let's just put one to the God we don't know. <laughs> All right, because they might be one. I mean, that's as close as they get, right? There could be a God out there. And so Paul uses that opportunity. He says, I notice you have a, an inscription here to an unknown God. And Paul uses the wisdom of God. He says, well, I'm going to talk, talk about that. He says, what you worship, he said, is unknown. I want to proclaim to you. In other words, this God that you don't know anything about, I want to tell you about him. Who is he? He's the God who made the world and everything in it. And he says, and being Lord of heaven and earth, 
He does not live in temples made with hands. Now, when he started probably saying that God made the world, everything in it, he's Lord of heaven and earth, some people there who were theists probably said, yeah, that's true. God, God made it. God made all of this. Yeah, it's true. He doesn't live in temples made with hands. Well, now, let's not go that far. Because we got our temples here. Everybody's got their own little temple. Here. This is our temple. Here. He doesn't live in temples made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands. In other words, as though he had need of anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And I'm sure there was some intellectual there who said, yeah, I believe that. That's true. I mean, God does. Yeah, probably he's God, Lord of heaven and earth. He made from one man every nation of mankind. And somebody stood up in the back and said, yeah, I believe that. Over all the face of the earth, yeah, we all come from one person. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, Paul keeps on uh, sharing them, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Why? Because he's omniscient. He's omnipresent, knows all, and is everywhere. For in him we live and move and have our being. And Paul isn't quoting here, God, he's quoting actually a philosopher by the name of Aratus. He was from Cilicia. In him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own prophets have said, or poets have said. We are indeed his offspring. And that was Epimenides, another philosopher. He was using their philosophers to speak to him and say, by the way, you know these guys. This is what they wrote. You all understand this. And then he says, being then God's offspring... In other words, God created us. We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, like all you guys have here, an image formed by the art and the imagination of men. We shouldn't think that God exists because we've imagined him in our hearts or in our minds. We made some kind of, a, of an art of him. Verse 30. The times, the times of ignorance. He says, God overlooked. In other words, all these idolatries, they're, they're, they look good, but they're ignorant. Now listen to what Paul is saying. I mean, I mean, Paul was an educated guy. And he starts by telling them where they are. And he takes them and he says, now the times of ignorance, these times of ignorance, God's overlooked it, by the way. But now, if I say now, now, now listen. Now he says, but now God, this God I'm telling you about, he commands all people everywhere to repent. About that time, people say, mm, repent. Why? Why has he commanded everyone to repent? Verse 31, because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to everybody, to all, by raising him from the dead. What is he talking about now? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about this God that they don't know anything about. And he begins to talk to them and says, God is going to judge the world. He's going to judge every one of you, me included. He's appointed a day. He can't change the day. It's already set. God's going to bring judgment in righteousness. In other words, God's going to judge fairly and justly. You know, people that don't know God, I was talking to someone about this the other day. Some people that don't know God, they still want justice, don't they? It's like when someone does them wrong, you don't have to know God to know that, hey, they should pay. Right? Hey, they done wrong, they should pay. And you take them to court, you might not be a Christian or anything, but you take them to court because you want them to pay. You want justice to be done. And my question to them was, wait a minute, if God doesn't exist, if ultimate justice, if there isn't a day when God's going to judge everything evil that has ever been done, if there is no justice, then what does it matter if you get punished for doing wrong or not? In, in the end, it doesn't matter. Right? But the Bible says that God has appointed a day in which he's going to judge everything that has ever been done wrong or evil. We will give an account. If we don't know God, we're in trouble. You think nobody knows Everybody's forgotten what I did. Nobody knows this about. Yeah, it's written down. God knows. And I thank God for the gospel because the gospel says everything that I've ever done, all my sins, Christ has paid by his blood. And I don't have to worry about that day. 
I am going to stand before God in judgment, but it'll be for my works. It'll be for a reward, not for salvation. I'm saved. Thank you, Lord. That means my sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is, and so Paul is telling them, listen, this God who created everything, he is the born today. He's going to judge the world. And the reason we know that he's going to judge the world is because he raised his son from the dead. He sent him here. Now he's going to talk to them about Jesus. And he understands, and Paul understands where they are. They're people who, unless God opens the door by divine grace to his gospel, they will not heed. They will not understand. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Because later on, Paul here in Acts goes on to say, you know, that some of them believed and some of them rejected. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's go back there. We were there earlier. How important is the gospel? And how important that we know where man stands in relation to God and the gospel. Totally depraved. He can't come to God on his own. He needs God's intervention of grace. The only hope that he has is through the preaching of the gospel. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. You see, Paul understood that when he preached that the Areopagus, these guys are great debaters. These guys are the philosophers of the age, but they can't know God through that wisdom. And so he begins to expound to them the gospel. In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. What does that mean? That means that God in his wisdom decided that you couldn't get to him through your own wisdom through your own reasoning powers. The only thing that reasoning does and the view of the universe and the the existence of everything is it makes you not have an excuse ever because God has shown the power in creation. God has shown who he is by writing his law in your heart and giving you the knowledge of right and wrong. But because you are dead, because you are dead in your sins, before you come to Christ, you can't do anything with that knowledge except suppress it. God said, you're not going to get to me by being a great intellect. And that's why God says that the greatest of intellects, the foolish, the, you know, the wise are foolish in his eyes. In the wisdom of God, God decided that the world did, would not come to know him through wisdom. It says, it pleased God. Everybody say pleased. What pleased God? Listen, it pleased God through the foolishness or the folly of what we preach to save those believe. It pleases God that through the announcement of the gospel of Christ, people will be saved. And so people today are saying in the church, we don't really need the gospel. You know, it's not, it's not necessary for people to believe in Christ as long as they're believing in God and somehow, you know, foolishness. Man cannot do that. And God designed it so they couldn't do that. It pleased God, how? By the preaching of the gospel, of the message, to save those who would believe. Look at verse 23. He goes on and says in verse 23, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach, what? Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. Paul acknowledges, listen, this is interesting to me. Paul acknowledges that the message that he was sent to preach It's foolishness to those who don't know God. And to the Jews, it causes them to stumble. They're on Messiah. They were waiting for and they didn't recognize him. But to the Gentiles, those who didn't know anything about God, they had their own ideas of God. He says, it's foolishness. And when you stop and think about the gospel, folk, it is foolish. And that's why sometimes we think, ah, you know, uh, this guy's real educated. Why in the world am I going to tell him that Jesus, you know... Think about how foolish it was during Paul's time. And even today, Paul was was preaching a Jewish carpenter who lived in Jerusalem and Palestine, Nazareth during that time, was crucified on a Roman cross. And this Jewish carpenter crucified on a Roman cross has an impact 
on my life today? How, do, how, how does that happen? As a matter of fact, Christians were made fun of during Paul's time. Because they say, you're God? Jesus, the one who came, he was crucified? And you want us to believe in that guy? Why in the world would we believe like the people that were there at the cross, at the crucifixion of Jesus that day, say, you know, he can't even save himself. He wants to save us. But what they didn't know is that that was God's plan. God had brought him to the cross because it was vital for Christ to die for the sins of the world. And the only way that God was going to forgive the sins of man who was lost in sin was to make them, bring them to faith in his son. To say that it is not necessary to believe in Christ, that some other way can get you there, is blasphemous to God. It's to disregard the most precious thing that God gave for the salvation of the world, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, listen, it's foolishness. I know what we preach is foolishness. And he's right. From a human perspective, Believing that this horrific, humiliated death of a Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago has some kind of an impact on my life today, let alone offer any kind of atonement for our sins. Sounds like madness. But Peter, who's also an apostle of Jesus, said in Acts 4.12, there is salvation, listen, in no one else. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so you have people today in the church, ministers, well-known ministers. As I said to you before, preaching Chrislam, Christ and Islam, they're, they're both the same God. No, they're not. And if your favorite preacher is preaching that, you need to get away from that preacher. It is blasphemy. If we are an angel from heaven preach to you another gospel. And they're saying, well, you know, Muslims, they come through Islam. And they, they believe in Allah. And after all, Allah and Jehovah, they're the same God. And as I've told you before, it's not the same God. As a matter of fact, Muslims, true Muslims will tell you it's not the same God. Because the God of the Jews had a son. And he sent his son into the world. Islam says Allah does not have a son. So it's not the same God. But yet today, as I said, to make the narrow gate wider, preachers are preaching that we don't really need faith in Christ alone for salvation. And Peter said, there is salvation in no one else. Why is it that it is only in Christ alone that salvation, God's salvation, is brought to sinners? Well, here in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 29, Paul says this. Listen, this is important. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Why did God say, this is the only way you can come to me? That you'll never have any reason to be able to boast in the presence of God. Listen to what he says in verse 13. Don't miss this. And because of him, who's him? That's God. Because of him, this is the reason, you are in Christ Jesus. You didn't come to Christ because you reasoned your way there. You didn't come to Christ because... There was a little spark of divinity in you and some little goodness in you that when you present it, you know, with the facts of the gospel that you reasoned it out and you somehow figured it out and you came. No, you're in Christ because of him. That's called grace. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us. Listen now, this is what Jesus has becomes to me. Wisdom. Jesus is my Wisdom. He is my righteousness that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. The Bible says Jesus gave his life. He is my sanctification. I am holy because of Christ. 
And I have been redeemed because of his blood. But don't miss this. It is because of him that you are in Christ. If you're in Christ Jesus today, you ought to say, thank you, Lord. Because on your own, you would never have come. You would have been like everybody else. You would have suppressed the truth. And some of you remember your past when you were first told about the gospel. And you, the, the, the darkness in your heart suppressed the truth. You didn't want to hear it. You ran away from people. You called them Jesus freaks. You did everything you could. You wanted to suppress that truth. But God had you marked and had you called. And so you couldn't run away. People tell me, okay, people can, can Christians lose their salvation? I said, I don't want out. Do you? I'm in Christ. I'm going, I'm going all the way. I don't want out. So I don't think about, I even think about that. But Jesus did say, I have you in my hand. No one can pluck you out. God, those whom God has given me, I'll raise them up at the last day. That's a promise. So I know my, my future secure. I know where I'm going. And I know that it's God in me who empowers me and equips me to live the life that he called me to live. Do I stumble? Do I, you know, sin sometimes again? Absolutely. So do you. But here's what you need to know. That's why God in Christ forgave you all your sins up front. He doesn't wait until later. He has forgiven you all your sins. Does that mean you don't sin anymore? Yes. Does that mean you don't have to repent when you sin? You do. Because there can, be, there can come temporal consequences for disobedience. But your eternal salvation is secure because of Christ. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that when Jesus said that, no one can pluck me out of his hand. He was telling the truth. The reason Peter, after he denied Jesus and cursed and did all of that, the reason he came back wasn't because Peter felt bad afterwards. No. He came back because Jesus said, you will deny me, but I have prayed for you that your faith not fail. And notice what Jesus said, and when you are converted, when you come back, strengthen your brethren. I like that. That's hope. So I know that when I stumble and when I sin, I say, God, forgive me. I, you know, I've sinned against you. And I see the approbation of God and the, you know, the smile of God when we do what he tells us. And he restores us. But this is what the gospel has done for us. It is the gospel that saved us, that brought us out of darkness through the pure grace of God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. And that's why it's biblically known as the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. The gospel of the grace of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and I want to close it. Here, real quickly, Paul says he's a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Whose gospel is it? It's God's gospel. It belongs to him. He is the one who, set, who, who formed it. He's the one who gave it to us. He's the one who sent us to preach it. We have no right to change it. We have no right to alter it. We have no right to substitute it. And in Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe it. Amen. And in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. It is a good news to be believed. But first, God calls you to repent. Repentance of sin. I wonder, have you done that? Have you repented? Should you die today? Is your eternity secure? Only through Christ can it be. Would you bow your head? Maybe you're watching online. 
You've never repented of your sin. You're a churchgoer. You've gone to church maybe all your life, but you've never repented and trusted in Christ alone for your salvation. Only God can open your ears and your eyes. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you, Lord, will perform your work. Jesus is the only name given under heaven by which we must be saved. There is salvation in no one else. And right there where you are and right here in this worship center, if you've never done that, tell him, Lord, I repent of my sin. I believe in your son. I believe in the gospel that only through Christ can I be set right with you. And so I call upon you today, Lord. I put my faith and my trust completely in Christ for my salvation in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.